How many of you guys know how to get around to all the stuff we have going on here, like to the rehearsal room or to the office or to where we eat? You guys know, know the way around? How many of you guys who know the way around are loud people? <laughs> all right, tall Jay. Come up here, man. All right, face them. Can you explain to them how to get from here up to the Chehi office? Well, <laughs> after you come out of this door, you take a right and get out of this building into that tunnel area. Then you head left and you continue down the path that leads to the music room, I believe, I think. You might be confused. <laughs> You, you may be confused. Have you been to the Chehi office? Uh, yeah, registration. Oh, that was a long time ago. Yeah, it was. Do you think any of anyone else might be able to help you out and give you directions on how to get there? Yes, Eric. All right, Eric. All right, explain to them and to Tall Jay because he needs it most of all. Um, how do you get to the Chehi office from here? Oh. I remember. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> take two, take two. <laughs> and you can help him out. Okay, take two. Um, after you come into this building, in fact, no, it's in this building. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. After you walk out of this door, <laughs> you go straight and go into the elevator. And is the Shea office on one, I mean, on two or three? Because Help him out. On two. Eric says it's two. So you take the elevator to the second floor, come Ooh. out, you'd be facing the, something like that, and then you take a left, <laughs> and you continue, and then you take the first right, and then you take another left, and it's the first door on your right. Okay. Good job. Good job. All right, so, yeah, that, that was much better than the first time. <laughs> I, was I was confused, and I want to know where you were saying that we should go, so, but, um, but let me ask you this. What if... I went out of here, and I went straight to the elevator, you know, because I don't want to walk upstairs, because mm. that would be healthy. And so I get in the elevator, and I come out of the elevator, and I want to go to the office, but I decide that I should go right instead of left out of the elevator. Is that cool? No. Why? You're going the wrong way. But why? But what if I just, I mean, I still want to go, but I don't like going left. <laughs> so I always go straight. It's kind of my thing to go right then you'll end up in the bathroom. <laughs> but I want to end up at the Chehi office. Then you should turn left. But it's my thing to go right. There's only one way. Yeah. What? It's only one way. You can only get to the Chehi office left. I can only go left? Yes. OK, well, you guys can sit down. Um, good job. <laughs> it, it took a little while, but you did do a good job. <laughs> All right, so one of the things that we know about directions and when we're trying to go from one place to another is when someone gives you directions, uh, they are helping you out, right? If you ask someone for directions, if, if I ask Tal hey, how do I get somewhere? And he tells me, I'm like, why would you tell me that? That's crazy, right? You don't, you don't get upset with people who are trying to help you go the right way. Uh, it's, it's somebody who's trying to assist you, trying to give you a hand. And so when you ask for directions or when you need directions or when you're lost and somebody gives you directions, and they tell you how to go the right way, it's such a good thing. It's actually really nice because if you guys have ever been lost, and I have been lost many times, because for some reason I keep losing like the GPS thing that's supposed to go in my car, uh, which is weird because it's supposed to just go in your car. But if I had a GPS to find my way to my GPS, then I wouldn't get lost. But I always end up getting lost and it's not exciting. It's not fun most of the time. Sometimes it's exciting, you end up places and you're like, oh, I don't know where I am and this is cool, but most of the time it's frustrating because you actually are trying to go somewhere because you're trying to go somewhere. And so, being lost... <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad that made sense to you. Um, um, so being lost in circumstances like that is painful or dangerous, and uh, especially uh, if it's very urgent. And so um, if you need to go somewhere and you get lost and you get directions, that is a great thing. But the problem is sometimes 
in our spiritual lives, we don't think of Jesus Christ as directions. You know, when people hear someone say, or Jesus say in John 14, when he said, I am the, the way, you know, the truth and the life, and, and no one comes to the Father except through me, people hear that and they go, what? That's, that's mean, that's exclusive, that's intolerant. And really that's not what it's about. It's not about being mean. It's about telling someone the right way to get where they want to go. Truth is always a good thing even when it's uncomfortable. Because if we just allow ourselves to maintain illusions or lies, then we don't grow, we don't learn, and we ultimately don't really live like we should or like we could. For instance, if, if I said 2 plus 2 is 5, and you guys are just like, okay, yeah, 2 plus 2 is 5, that's fine. Okay, and then sometime later in life I need that basic skill and you didn't help me out, it could really mess things up, like on my taxes. I don't know about you guys, but I have to do taxes now because I'm old, and if I messed it up like that, I would be sad because 2 plus 2 isn't 5, it's only 4, and do you guys know what I'm saying? All right. Anyway, so it's really important that we understand that giving directions and giving exact and precise directions isn't, isn't the wrong thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And so when I, I wonder why people have such a problem with accepting what we believe about Jesus being the only way to heaven. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that a lot of it has to do with believing that you have been wrong. People don't like to be wrong. I, I don't like to be wrong. Some of you guys I've had conversations with and I know that you don't like to be wrong. But really what, what faith in Christ is all about and what directing someone to Jesus is all about is simply just giving directions. Simply just pointing someone in the right way. Just like Tall Jay was helping me understand how to get up to the Chehi office and said, hey, if you go right, you're not going to end up where you need to go. You're not going to end up making it to the office. You're going to end up in that studio that's always locked. And then I'm going to think that's the office. I'm going to try and get in. And I'm going to wonder why no one lets me in. And then I'm going to be sad. <laughs> and that will be sad. So you got to go the right way. And if Tall J gives you directions, though, you should, might want to double check. But. <laughs> Uh, but once you find the right way to go, you need to go that way. And this argument comes up all the time, though. I actually, if you guys remember from the first day when we were talking about Liz, the lady I met in the airport, we talked about this because she was telling me about this delicious pizza. She's like, man, I had this great pizza and we're stuck in Cleveland for eternity. So, you know, if you're hungry, you, know, you can go down there and get some pizza. And we talked about how, you know, there was a way to go and get that pizza. And if I went a different way, then I could miss out on what that pizza was, on the experience of it. I actually never got to get that pizza. So in my mind, it's like the greatest pizza of all time because I haven't tasted it yet and she was raving about it. So, but she said, you go down this, you go down this hallway, you turn left over here and then you'll see it on your left. That's a lot more simple than getting to the Chehi office. And we ended up talking about that later on the plane because she was saying, well, I believe that all ways are a way to God. I believe that, you know, whatever you do, if you just try and love people, it doesn't matter what you believe, that you'll get to God. And we started talking about pizza because it is delicious and because it made a great point that if we wanted to be getting pizza in the airport, that we'd have to go one particular way to get that piece of pizza. That if we walked left, we got pizza. And if we walked right, we got run over by a plane. And so, <laughs> the, you know, we really needed to go a certain way. And there was a right way and there was a wrong way. There was a way that ended in deliciousness and there was a way that ended up with TSA tackling us. So, you know, we had to go one way to get where we were going. And I'm harping on this so much because in our culture, it's such a pervasive thought that it's wrong to say that anyone else is wrong. But it's right to tell the truth. No matter what, it is important for us to be honest about the truth. If you went to the doctor's office and, and you had been feeling sick and the doctor discovered that you, you were very ill and that you needed some serious treatment, it's important that the doctor would give you the tough news and not just say, man, I don't want to share this hard news 
you know, I don't want to tell Kelly he's sick, so I'm just going to pat him on the back and say, healthy as a horse, get on out of here. Because if he did that, I would end up paying the price. And so it's important that he would deliver to me the news of what was going on in my health, even if it was difficult. Because if he didn't do that, the consequences could be huge for me later on. And as believers, we have to be willing to tell the truth and to share who Jesus is with other people. And this whole week we've talked about the mind. You know, we've talked about how great God is and how we can set our mind on him and focus on him. And we've talked about how believing and, and understanding that he is greater than anything else can help us overcome sin. So we've talked about understanding the mercy of God as the motivation to live for him. And those are all internal things for us. But our faith is not just about us because our God said he came to seek and to serve the lost. And we as his people, as his followers, are called to do the same thing. So when we engage the Bible, it must cause us to engage the world. When we have an interaction with the one true God, it has to cause us to reach out and share that God with other people who desperately need him. We have to give them the hope that we have. And there's one argument that comes out of this, and, and I hear this all the time. People say, well, what if there's more than one way to heaven? What if you're right, Jesus is a good way, but there's also other ways? Because people ask me, well, Kelly, if you were born in Africa or the Middle East or something, wouldn't you be speaking at, you know, Islamic Shehi and sharing about Islamic faith because you're an Islamic person and you'd be telling everyone that there's only one way and it's the Muslim way. And I don't know why by the grace of God I've been given what I've been given or why I grew up where I grew up or why I live where I live or have been able to be exposed to the truth of the gospel like I have been. But just because I don't understand how all the ins and outs of how God reached me work, doesn't mean that I have to question whether or not my relationship with God is real. Because if you know someone, you know that you know someone. If you're close to someone, you know what it means to be close to someone. And so this idea that every kind of faith could be a way to God doesn't make any sense. And the biggest reason is the cost. Why would Jesus choose to lay down his own life? Why would the God of the universe choose to pay the price for our sins with his own blood if there were a hundred other ways for us to get to heaven? Imagine this. How many of you guys uh, actually listen to music instead of just playing it? How many of you guys have like an MP3 player? How many of you guys have an actual iPod? All right. How many of you guys actually bought your iPod? All right. Cool. Okay, so imagine this. The new iPod comes out, you know, and you see the commercial for it, and, and so you understand that if you don't get it, you will die, right? You've seen it, it's shiny, you know, someone cool is listening to it, and you're like, man, this thing looks sweet. I must have it. So you, you're like, man, I'm going to go to the store, I'm going to get this iPod. And so you get online, and you start looking up prices for the new iPod, and you find out at Best Buy, it costs $300. But amazingly, at Walmart, it costs $100. Where are you guys going to go get your iPod if you have to pay for it yourself? Walmart, right? Nobody's going to be like, man, I could get three of these at Walmart or one of these at Best Buy. They're the same thing. This is a tough choice, right? You go with one automatically because you know that this is a greater value, that this actually makes sense, that you can get the exact same thing for less. And when we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, if we could achieve heaven, if we could have a relationship with God, if we could somehow please him by just living right or by being good enough, or by doing enough good acts, why would, he send, why would God send his own son to die for us? It absolutely doesn't make any sense, especially when you think about what it meant 
for Jesus to be on the cross. You know, we consider and we thought quite a bit yesterday about the, the pain of the cross. But there's so much more to the gospel story than that. Consider that the king of heaven left perfection to live here on earth. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but earth is kind of messed up. It's not heaven. There's war and famine and pain. There's sickness and disease. There's selfishness and evil. And God left the perfection of heaven and his own glory behind so that, so that he could live here with us. And not only that, but he lived here not only in a messed up world, but with messed up people, with haters and backstabbers, with people who are cruel, people who are liars, people who are us. And then he endured the pain of the cross, that horrible suffering, but not only that, bore the weight of our sins. That he became the curse for us. That he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. And when you consider that cost, how could we ever say, well, Jesus made this one way, but there's a lot of other cheaper ways that do the same thing? There's no way to logically make that work. There's no way to take the gospel and everything else as true. We can only believe that Jesus is God and he did what he did or everything else or anything else. It can't be a both and. And we read this yesterday, but I want you guys to hear it again. It's from Philippians chapter 2. It says this. It says, Though he was God, talking about Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, but instead he gave up his divine privileges and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And God became a man, left his, his power and, and his majesty to become in our form for you. And he died a criminal's death on the cross for you. And that is amazing love, but, but the passage continues, and this is where it gets incredible. It says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So here's what we just read, that Jesus is the one true God, that he left heaven and died for us, a gross and painful death that we actually deserved. And he did it because of his love for us. And now we have a chance to turn to him and to be saved and to know him and have a life that never ends with our Lord forever. And that he made this one way. Because it says something just as important that Jesus is on the place of highest honor, that he is above all other gods and all other re religions because he is the one. He is the one who is above everything else. He is the one who is real. He is the one who is strong. Like it says in Romans chapter 11, that everything is from him and everything is for him, that it's all about his glory. No one else Nobody else gets a piece of it. That all of this is about the one true God, and that is Jesus Christ. The one who paid the price for your sins. The one who loves you. And so, when we say that following Jesus and believing in what he did for us on the cross is the only way to heaven, it's not about us being self-centered. It's not about us saying, I'm right and you're wrong. It's about us saying, there is a God who loves you. There is a God who knows you and is willing to pay the price for your sins so that you can have life with him that never ends. It's not about being arrogant. and It's not about winning an argument. It's about sharing what we've been given. And it is kind to give people proper directions. If someone is lost and struggling to get somewhere and you know where they're going and you see them walking around or whatever, looking in windows and you know where you're, they're going, for you to just say, well, maybe they'll find a way. That's cruel. That's mean. If you know the way, you have to share the way. And it's not loving 
for us to just let people flow through life when we know how to connect them with the God who loves them just as much as he loves you. And for some reason as Christians, once we know Christ, we have a tendency to believe that somehow we are better than someone else. And that is so far from the truth. We aren't better than anyone. We aren't saved because we're good. We're God's children because he adopted us, not because we adopted him. So we need to be about the business of introducing people to their father so that they can be a part of this family too. And I know in our cultures and in our schools and the communities that we live in, sometimes it can be very difficult for us to talk about Christ especially in the face of other people because we don't want to cause dissension and we don't want to cause dispute and we don't want to hurt people or ruin uh, friendships or uh, we're just afraid of tension. But Jesus went through so much for us that there is no reasonable obstacle that should stop us from sharing who he is and what he's done with the people around us. And the reality is that this is your message to share because I love talking about Jesus but I don't know your friends. I don't live in your town. I don't sleep in the same house with your family. But you do. And you have Christ. You don't, you don't need uh, a speaker. You don't need a, a, a wise, older person. You don't need anything other than Christ because God is faithful to work through you. He's not just going to leave you hanging. He doesn't say, hey, be my child and share the gospel. Share what I've done with you with other people. And I'm going to laugh at you while you mess it up. That's not what our God does. He's not cruel. When you step out, and when you choose to strive to make a difference in the life of somebody else by sharing what God has done for you, God will come through for you. God is with you, and God will be on your side. So we need to turn this focus outward. You know, all week we've been focusing in my life. What does it mean for me to follow Christ? What does it mean for me to be the person that God is calling me to be? And that always ends at the same point. It means for me to be a person who, like Christ, wants to serve other people at any cost. We need to turn our focus outward and serve other people by giving them the truth, by giving them love by introducing them to the God who made them, the God who gave up his life for them, and ultimately the God who is their only hope for life. And like we pointed out, this can be difficult, but it's so important for us to persevere. It's so important for us to press on and to, to just move forward. In Acts chapter 5, which if you guys ever want to be inspired to follow Christ more, when we were talking about the word earlier, you should check out the book of Acts. It's an amazing story of how the church really began uh, as it is today. But in Acts chapter 5, it says that there's religious leaders who are, who are jealous of all these people who are coming to follow Christ because the apostles were going around and unashamedly saying that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that he was the way, that he was the one way to find eternal life. And they were sharing this and people were turning from their sins and people were turning from their old uh, worthless beliefs because they were recognizing that this God is real. That this God actually saves. That this God transforms people. And so what the religious leaders did is they said, hey, uh, we need to throw these apostles in jail. So what they do is they go and they find them and they, and they grab them and they throw them in jail. They're like, okay, enough of that. Problem solved. These guys are in jail. They'll never be able to... Uh, share the gospel again. They'll never be able to, uh, you know, throw off what we're trying to do here. They'll never be able to disrupt what we're trying to accomplish with this crazy Jesus stuff. But something incredible happens. That very night, the Bible says, an, an angel of the Lord comes and, and he frees them in the middle of the night and they actually leave prison and the guards don't even know because they go out right in the middle of the night. And so you think, man, they're fugitives. And I've seen enough movies to know that when someone, you know, escapes from prison, they take a flight to a foreign country and they change their name and they get a bunch of different passports so that no one will know that they are the ones who, you know, are being tracked, that they're the ones who are under arrest, that they're the ones who belong in jail. But you know what the apostles do? 
They go right back to the temple the next day. They go right back to the center of town, exactly probably where they got arrested. And they start preaching the gospel again. And then the, the religious leader's like, aren't you in jail? And then they, you know, they pull, them again, pull them in again and the story continues on. But what's amazing to me is they persevered. And odds are that you guys probably aren't going to be thrown in jail, although it's possible, but probably not right now going to be thrown in jail for, for sharing Christ with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, with the people who you come in contact with. You probably won't be, but it still can be difficult. But just like the apostles, if we persevere, Christ will come through. God wants his message to get out. And we are the way that God accomplishes that. So if we don't share about him, who will? How's your best friend going to find out about Christ if even you aren't willing to say something? And the beautiful thing is, that people who care about you are much more likely to care about the things that you care about. There's crazy statistics out there, um, and I don't even love statistics, but they point to the fact that most people are open to the idea of just discussing truth, discussing spiritual things, and discussing things that really matter. So don't be afraid. Understand that it is okay that there's only one way. That doesn't make you a bigot. That doesn't make you close-minded. That makes you a messenger, one who's offering directions to people who are lost. And that's not a person who hates, that's a person who loves. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we just thank you so much for what you've done for us. We thank you for the gospel and that you would leave heaven to come find us. And God, we just ask that you would put a desire in us uh, to be sharing the good news. That we wouldn't allow ourselves to be inconsistent anymore. That we wouldn't be able to say, God, I love you for what you give me, um, but I'm not willing to give back to you. God, show us the people in our lives who, who you're calling us to share to. Bring to mind the people around us who are lost. And give us the strength to step up and reach them. And give us the wisdom to know how to do it best. And after that, help us to be committed to pray and to serve and to continue doing this. Because we say that we want to be like you. And such a giant part of that is sharing who you are and what you've done for us. Thank you for using us. Help us to be used. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.